Welcome. This is the October 1st Jalen Zones production user call. We have Phil, Tara, Jan, Dave, Matthias, and myself, Michael. And uh, Tara has an update on Doug's OCI work. Uh, you, I'll say you have the floor. Thank you very much. So I'm just relaying information from the developer. Um, if you are lucky, we are going to have probably official images by 14.2. Uh, which is actually finger crossed, you're right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, the thing is that probably for the first iteration, there will be just artifacts. I mean, the, the um, OCI exports. So you need to then podman load the, the, the artifact itself. I don't believe, and please excuse me. I'm in the same problem with you, Michael. Um, uh, that will be, he's also working on uh, on having an official container registry, but uh, I think that will, will take more than, than the 14.2. But it's a first step. I mean, the link there in the document will go to the actual review that um, Doug made. Um, it's pretty interesting. And it goes with the modification of a workflow, the engineering workflow to have the OCI images as well. Oh, on my birthday. Oh. Oh. What a guy. I'm so pleased with his choice of that. Okay, initial format. Can you explain the uh, either object or export or manual step that might be automated in the future? So the thing is that uh, the automation would be to push the image to a registry. Oh, fair so enough. the so what what we what we will have is that the Docker equivalent of save and load. Okay. That will be the same of Podman save and load, which actually load all the layers, save all the layers uh, in between. That would be expected only one layer because it comes from scratch. Um, um. But then you can load the OCI images like it's local, and then you can push it to a local registry if you wish. Um, okay. Yeah, there is a roadmap, but yeah, they need the registry. It's still work in progress. So the good news about this is that the images that Doug is producing is using those scripts in the link below github.com, DFR, FreeBSD images. And those are based on, uh, a few lines down, Michael. Yeah, I see yeah, that. That's, that's one. Fantastic. Yeah, all right. And it, it was able to squeeze it down to 40 meg, which honestly with Ocam BSD, I never made it. Understood. So my lowest my lowest one was something like 200 meg. And You're measuring uh, the yeah. same way? Sorry? Are you measuring the same way? Not that one of you is measuring with compression and the other without. Uh, I'm measuring with the same way, yeah. But keep in mind that is actually the minimal is really minimal minimal. While, uh, for example, mine version, my version was with almost everything except the compilers. So yeah, I mean, I believe the difference here is using package space, but I'm pretty new on this. Uh, uh, Jan, you have a question? Uh, as, a, yep. I have, as a um, compliant hosting product, I, I don't believe you can do that with load, but I, I, I need to check because I think it's doable to load an image from an HTTP, but I, don't know if it's something related to Podman because Docker doesn't have it. So because if you can, without massive uh, expansion, pre-compile the uh, OCI distribution specification into, let's say, directory of content addressed uh, files or file names, like SHA-256 of the content of a tar and then place it in a directory structure in some way, that would probably be easy to retrofit on the CDN, whereas if it requires every mirror to run uh, a full uh, dynamic content server, that's a lot harder to scale out. So the, the I, I'm not sure about the question. 
Um, if you're referring to, are you referring to the output um, of the, the artifact? Uh, the distribution of the artifact so that uh, the FreeBSD project can self-host the infrastructure to make it accessible and not just push artifacts in some uh, third-party um, registry. I think that the, so there are two ways of handling this. I'm, I'm not sure because I'm, of course, I'm not involved in the process, so I can report what I see. Um, the output of the, um, the artifact would be a single file, which is a tarball, basically, and that could be hosted mm -hmm. everywhere. And that is supposed That's... to be hosted in download.freebsd.org. Yeah, uh, but that is what... just the OCI image. Right. That you... makes it available uh, implementing the OCI distribution specification, if I understand that correctly. No, the but distribution... I'm not familiar with a distribution specification protocol. <laughs> Of, not. Uh, and if you can, by getting fancy, use uh, Nginx to kind of translate query parameters into paths and then pre-generate the content in some way. Not not really. So the, what we can do for oh, stage one. Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, we, what we can do for stage one is put the exported, the, the tables, which is table plus metadata, up on the web server, our normal distribution server, and then that's signed by our usual GPG keys. Um, it's also possible to sign these keys in such a way that, sorry, sign the, the tables in such a way that you can verify them when you fetch them into your registry. So your local registry can be set up so that it expects keys and it expects signatures from certain, um, certain upstream systems. And then when you import into your registry, it would say, yeah, I know this one, it's signed, but that's maybe stage two here. Yep. Um, proper registry services require other stuff, uh, requires um, some special API calls. And I don't think you can just do that with Nginx. But it, I don't would think it be either. valid to um, serve redirects and then no. point uh, into the, oh, damn. Okay, no, uh, yeah, I found it in the APIs, but no, it has to be 200 code, so you can't just redirect it apparently to uh, some existing blobs serving location. Tar, is this your comment about Zusa Studio? Yeah, something Tell like that. Yeah, that. well, I, I would like to, since the this experiment, I would like to experiment more about the package base, mm. especially when it comes to um, multiple outputs. And I was had this idea of, I don't know if you're familiar about SUSE Studio or Kiwi. Nope, enlighten us, please. Okay. okay, it was a web interface or a kind of easy way for um, a developer or someone to pick up the components of an operating system they want and produce an output of um, several several outputs. Usually, until a few years ago, was only um, virtual virtual images like uh, VMDK or raw images. But I was thinking maybe we can produce several outputs like jail image or um, OCI image, VM image, or even cloud compatible VM image with cloud in it, for example. Mm. I don't know if it's a good idea or not. Is the Maybe back end open source and nicely licensed? I think it's it's open source, yes, because now it has been deprecated and now has been moved into the um, SUSE. Um, Building studio, mm. OBS. Probably, I believe there was somebody on probably on the be by Beehive call from SUSE that could be of help. Yeah, no, we don't quite have a rep there, but I'm looking that is that perhaps SUSE Studio Express? No, yes, but basically it tells you 
download these terrible files and run OBS. The, 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 the website is obs.suza.something. dot something. Um, yes, like, like Okay. OBS. Yeah, keep the links flowing. We'll just can never have too many links. Yeah, build open .org. I'll put it in the chat. No, probably it's best if I put it on directly I don't know if straight to in the document. doc is fine. I can find Yeah. it home. I found a good Kiwi link that describes building well system appliances with Kiwi and NG. Cool. Okay. Yeah. But I think um, that has been anything deprecated. related to stuff more accessible Oh. would be great because we've got like Pudria, we've got make files and all of the stuff is um, quite opaque to the uh, newcomer to FreeBSD. It's sort of, you need to understand the entire release process, all of our make files, and then it's quite straightforward to deal with. But that initial hump is just so large. So anything that makes this easier would be great. Yeah, I agree. Um, and just to just to clarify, that was kind of an idea of of something I can work on. Not that I want actually to to use the building process from SUSE. We will not discourage you. Matthias, did you have questions regarding OCI that maybe Tara can answer at this point now that she's painted that picture? Uh, well, um, I saw that you you wrote Tara uh, a uh, or you maintain a uh, an equivalent to uh, the FreeBSD images uh, tool uh, by uh, by Doug. Uh, is there any um, specific use case uh, for each? So I'm talking about the the FreeBSD images uh, uh, script. Okay. Um, So any any re any moment I should go more to one and another to to the other or So I have two at the moment. One is the generic full image of FreeBSD. And probably that would be very helpful if you want to um, build something. For example, if you want to use Rust or Golang to produce an artifact or for a binary, I would definitely go for a full distribution because otherwise I've measured it. You, you don't have a real advantage of sizing compared to what it could have been an Occam BSD image. So Well, you, you, I would go for, for a full, full distribution instead. And fine, then fine, I would fine, use fine, the, fine. the Go ahead. sorry. And then I would use the, um, the reduced image to, um, to actually distribute the, the program itself. Uh, but hold on your horses because probably the solution made from dog is actually better than what I came out with. Uh, with the BSD minimum. So I would use the, probably I should, did, did I actually share the um, two-stage building? No, hold on a sec. Um, GitLab.com. Sure. I I haven't seen it, I think. Okay. Yeah, it's an, it's an easy one. It's, again, it's not rocket science, yeah. And shall I put it on, 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 uh, You can on go the doc? straight on the document. Absolutely. It's your call, your doc. Yeah. Of Uh, yeah, I mean, just move it around if you need it. So the course. snippet here Yep. is, okay, uh, as a classical two stage. So the one is, yeah, if you can open it, Michael. Absolutely. Thank you. No, don't tell me. Uh, oh, wait, something's happened. Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Oof. Wow. Yeah, but just a couple of tabs I would. <laughs> so if you if you see it's nothing like it's no rocket science. You have the first stage using the full container, uh, the full image as build. You build in this case. I'm trying to show how to compile in both in Rust and Go. And then I use the second image to have the the actual output in a reduced image. Uh, but for the second one, probably I would use the um, Doug's uh, images on the way forward.
Super clear. Thank you. A stupid question, which I, I think I have already asked, but uh, didn't write it down. Uh, is there a, a landing page for this call where I can find the um, document uh, URL? Uh, you mean the, the testing? Sorry, sorry. Right now I was asking uh, about the, the these calls, the big document, because then I can then I can get to your. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. I'll put it in the chat right now. It's on the callfortesting.org list to all calls and all documents, but it's now in the chat. Okay, and uh, sorry, wh where did you say that uh, the landing page is? Because that's the one I will. Uh, I will. Uh... I think uh, there I is no dedicated uh, landing oh, okay. page for it. It's only a document and a set of email addresses. Michael spams to uh, sorry, not spam. But... Um, regarding that, let's take a quick look here. And this was one of my last housekeeping efforts short of posting talks. Uh, this could definitely be prettier. There's no question whatsoever. Um, but I have hopefully accurately said, here's the agenda and minutes, which is this document. And the agenda and minutes for each one, there is a calendar link and the YouTube link. So I could put that more clearly in parentheses, but at the top of each call are hopefully all those resources. And I'm absolutely open to suggestions on how to make that more clear because it's just been organically forming over since, I don't know, since 2018. Beautiful. That, that answers way. your question. Go ahead. It's, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Okay. And sure. it's beautiful that way. Uh, yeah, I, this, uh, I make it up as I go. And uh, Tara, again, I apologize for mentioning clang, clang, clang over your speaking. Uh, as I've looked at this problem for 20 years straight, it always came down to the tool chain. And I now kind of retroactively wish there had been a separate distribution set in FreeBSD since 20 years ago of the tool chain, because it is typically the thing that distinguishes a little web server in a jail from a development system in a jail. So there I said it. Again, I apologize, and all of my Occam BSD stuff has largely come down to noting that the tool chain is the single biggest differentiator in a between a small system and a large system. Yeah, it's something like it's not your not your fault. It's like when you use the toolbox, it's something like bumps from two hundred to eight hundred back. Yeah, and not everyone's a developer needing a complete tool chain. That's just exactly exactly, especially when it comes to um, security issues. If if you want to have a jail, you probably don't, and you want to expose it. You probably don't want to have a compiler inside because if I came in and yes, give came them in, the I can compile my own rootkit. To... Exactly, yeah. uh, bingo. <laughs> that's come on. That's security by obscurity. If Fair I enough, can run but... the compiler with my exploit, I can also unpack a tarball. Yeah. Um... Yeah. Or, just execute a shell archive to unpack itself. Uh, if I have yeah, it's actually. Thank you, thank you for your nice idea about how about the command and control. Hmm? Yeah, I mean, there is a point where you intentionally cripple the user land available so far that it becomes harder to explore it in a meaningful way by removing basically write access to the file system so that you can't persist your code in a path. And then uh, if you remove all the libraries you expect, except for the ones you one or two executables need, okay, then it becomes hard because there is no shell, there is no nothing. Um, there's, let's say, uh, yeah, just like run a little executable in its libraries. Jan, and save it for Friday's direct. security call. Really? Save it for Friday's security call. Which call? Exactly. Um, okay. So, okay. Uh, any questions regarding OCI images and those specific strategies? And who not, is not on the strategies? Okay, we'll get. And Phil sure. had some questions on strategies too, so I'm sure we'll get to them. But let's go through the the actual uh, go through the agenda items and then punch in there. Who is typing here now? Warning, there are trimmed images for EC2 now. Oh, okay. That's uh, me. 
um, that actually got committed. Oh, uh, great. Let's, uh, and Dave, that's a perfect segue to your update on, was it delegated things? So uh, let's. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, not so much delegated things. So it is specifically on jails. So for, um, I guess the last, since we started this call, I've had a couple of things that I really wanted, which was getting metadata onto jails so that you can tag them with generic information. Um, and the other one was, um, oh yeah, enforcing kernel assigned UUIDs for jails on startup, not allowing them to provide their own ones. And both of these is with a view to um, having jail systems where the, uh, like, like a CI system, where we're not entirely clear exactly what's happening inside because it's untrusted user processes creating jails and we want to have some sort of control over them. So I've asked um, uh, Igor Ostapenko to have a look at that and um, we'll come back when we have some more information ideas on how we might be able to do that. And that's with a view to getting some code in that actually does these things. So we've discussed it for, I guess, for over a year or so, and it's time to try and move those forward. Um, so specifically for the storing metadata, the proposals, what we already talked about, using the OSD um, objects already attached to jails to store more stuff in them. And depending on how straightforward it is, we'll either do just a single key value, or um, if it's not too difficult, allow multiple key values um, and the initial implementation of that. You and have a link for, for that? Oh, sorry. Uh, OSD, yes, OSD. Um, it's how jails attach their ZFS information, like, um, Ah, yes. Uh, I can put it here. So, so how does that, yeah, how does the jail, how does the kernel know which jails? Um, so, so OSD is a way to basically attach metadata with a heap address in the kernel. Yeah. Yeah, you have to do that. That's one or multiple. Um, mm -hmm. oh I think the obvious way would be to uh, use sysdls for this. For the second one, yeah. So the um, the proposal, at least the initial discussion, I shouldn't say proposal yet, for um, enforcing UUID assignments. So to recap, the problem we have is that when you create a jail, um, two things happen. First, the process jails itself. So the thing that you want to know what's ID it is doesn't have it. And on the outside, the process that was doing the jailing disappears into jail, and you have no way of knowing um, what jail ID was assigned. So you have a kind of a, um, what's it called now? Time of use, time of check sort of hole, um, not availability. But um, you've got a process that typically will fork, and a one fork will create a jail, and then the other fork will rush very, very quickly to try and figure out um, what <laughs> what that UID is. And the idea here is we make two things. We enforce the, um, with a sys control, the kernel will always override any provided UUID. So a jail won't be able to create its own UUID. But as a consequence of this, um, we, we think we can make it a little bit easier to get that information back. We still don't have an, any good idea on, on the last bit. Um, and that was why my earlier question around um, what about jail descriptors um, came up, maybe we can talk about that at the end of the call, is that an option? Anyway, that's the two pieces. Um, and uh, yeah, hope, hope, hope they won't go in for 14, but maybe we'll get them in 15, who knows? Um, but hope to have some news for you um, on what our plans are for this soon. Any questions for Dave? Cool. Well, thank you. And I hope everyone caught Dave's talk at EuroBSDCon. Video should be up relatively soon and great work. Um, while an anonymous beaver is typing, uh, maybe uh, Phil, you were oh yeah you're still on you were one of the earliest in and you were just trying to 
answer the broad question about populating jail. And I think people have mapped out some some pretty breaking news strategies. D does that help you or are you still kind of left with questions on just, OK, all things considered, how do we build a jail in Q4 2024? Well, I, I think the uh, the challenge that I have is that I went to BSD Can and listened to the presentations at EuroBSD and got more ideas and have more questions. Hmm. <laughs> I, I think that's where the, the challenge is, is not, um, you know, what is, I, I guess it comes down to in the future, I think I'd like to have the idea of a, an appliance type of a device uh, that has jails as its mechanism for separating appliances. And in, in my specific case, uh, there is an application. So it's a, an open source application that runs on its own. And then a Postgres database that could be in its own separate database or its own jail. And then uh, custom ETL tools that populate the, the database and feed into the application. Uh, and, you know, thinking of the ideas that uh, there was a run your own mail server uh, book that just came out by, you know, one of our favorite authors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, to think, okay, could that just be populated as a jail with all the pre-configured stuff, uh, you know, in it? And then, you know, add on to that all the different applications, you know, whether that's uh, NextCloud or whatever. So, I mean, those other things are ideas, but how would we have it so that uh, we can easily uh, not only create them? Because, I mean, there's too many ways to create jails today, either, you know, by hand or with the various tools, uh, but also maintain them. So with each of the, uh, you know, starting in this example, uh, you know, 14.1 release or whatever release version and keep it up to date with the patches. Uh, you know, is, is there a, a an optimal way to make uh, at a small scale the management of uh, a handful, you know, thinking five to 10 jails on a, a given uh, small scale server to make it easy to, to build and maintain? Um, yes, I think so. Starting with FreeBSD 14, it can be done with a few shell scripts, which are a bit out there and package based. And jail.conf includes to not repeat yourself a thousand times. And is that so, with dot include doing the heavy lifting? Yeah, that's just for the duplication so that yeah. you don't have to copy and paste a lot of time. So just basically encapsulating the logic to do it because you can use a jail.conf to do the initial jail file system preparation. So the appropriately named exec.prepare hook. Um, this, the document started this morning with this lovely dot include example, which sounds like it was from you. Uh, is there a canonical Q4 2024 blog post or napkin note or wiki page or anything on how to do that? And again, for, I don't know, mortals? Not yet, uh, because I had to take work calls. So I couldn't I finish what I wanted to do. Okay, so... Uh, Bill, is it clear how the dot include handles the deduplication of effort? Oh, yeah. DRY, I, do not repeat yourself. Yeah, I was just wondering if there's a, a, a tool set that is going to last for a long time or if it's you know still a lot in flux with the various tools that are out there that I, I think probably most people on the call have seen the, the coming and going of the various uh, helper tools. Yeah. Uh, you know, so is it basically use the tools that are in base and go with that? Or are some helper tools going to be a better way to manage things? Well, the helper tools, as we've covered in both the Beehive and Jail Calls, is that for want of tools like dot include, which is directly attributable to the calls, 
it's like we looked at what mistakes are they constantly making and what facilities are they lacking in the OS itself. And it's things like the jail descriptors and dot include where, oh, uh, people are forced to reinvent that wheel because that wheel's never been invented within the base OS. So the it's it's not the helpful answer that people want, but dot include is intended to make it so simple mm -hmm. that you have a little core logic here, a little more core logic here, and they all work together. And that hopefully precludes the need for a super fancy web interface to add those few snippets of text. But that gets back to, okay, so yet another jail manager. I like yeah. that. Uh, yes. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, that said, we I think it's upon us to really start uh, documenting this because it's a disservice to have the tool and have people say, we need a tool like this. And we say, hey, it arrived in 14. Like, what's wrong with us? So I will quote you on that because there's another t-shirt idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. My, my so, two tips. Oh, you go ahead. Um, um, what I noticed is that as soon as I started to put things into uh, jail into reused snippets to be included from a per jail, jail.com, that worked yep. great to share defaults like the Z pool and so on uh, to define a bunch of variables. But as soon as I did it for non-trivial hooks, it became a pain in the posterior uh, to uh, double and triple quote uh, shit. But uh, with the level 20 or so line change to uh, the jail.conf parser to uh, read uh, executable config files, not directly, but execute them and then read the, their standard output, you can delegate the quoting to a little 10 line shell script uh, to run basically your uh, your non-trivial shell script through uh, this to quote it and then unquote some escape hatch so that you can still access jail.conf variables from the shell script. If you want to without polluting the shell by default, uh, a reasonable uh, approximation of that one of those dangerous 95% done things can be done in 10, 12 lines of shell. Yeah. Uh, runs quickly. And it, again, the worst thing about shell scripts is how much you get done uh, with them. Uh, so, yeah. Well, um, let's over the next three later. months focus on oh. getting these cool science projects into usable mm -hmm. documentation. I'll just kind of be beating that drum. But yeah. uh, we're still on the OCI side, I think. Yeah. And... So my, my two cents for jails is you have to ask yourself the fundamental question, which is how are you going to use them? And that kind of points you towards what works, what is going to work best. Do you need to orchestrate your jails across many physical servers, so jail hosts? Um, do you want to um, have them output as some sort of piece of a CI process, you have this sort of jail flavored artifact that you can then deploy to other systems. And at least until now, so prior to OCI stuff being um, sort of publicly available, generally available, I still go back to use jail.conf stuff that's in base and use ZFS snapshots. And, and basically all jails end up with the same thing. You unpack you create an empty ZFS data set, um, you unpack um, base.txz into it, run TZ setup, modify um, your like rc.conf and um, resolve.conf, and then that's basically it. You're ready to go, throw in some base packages if you want. And, um, and at least for my case, I've then kept those pre-prepared templates, um, export them as a ZFS, data set and then import them on multiple servers um, using some package scripts for that, which is clunky but workable. Yeah. And I don't use the I don't use the resolve comp from from um, from base. So I use a different one. Yeah. But what do yeah. you change in resolve.conf? Um so I specifically I don't let the host use the same DNS services as the jail. So the jails I treat as untrusted. And if they end up doing anything like um, trying DNS cache poisoning, I want to know that the host system remains intact. So the host system um, 
just uses its own resolver directly and um, the jails use only um, uh, local unbound running on the host. So they can't use external DNS, they have to use the jail host provided one and the jail host doesn't use that. Is that documented somewhere? Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's in my so tutorial. I, <laughs> it's in my tutorial. I guess that kind of counts. Yeah. Okay, yeah. kind of counts. For the what I would feature. consider is instead of uh, deploying a resolve conf to every jail, make a caching DNS resolver available on every uh, jail's loopback address. Because the resolver, if there is no resolve conf, will just ask uh, the IPv4 loopback IP address. Um, yeah, so true. then you don't need a resolve conf uh, if you mm. just need working DNS resolution. Yeah, Put it, we, we still have one, but that would also work. Yeah, you don't need to provide it. And it doesn't even have to be local. It can also be a, just a forward the loopback IP to some external service if you want, but just make it available. No, that's not... Uh, yeah, the other alternative is to uh, nullfs mount the host or a canonical at least etc resolve conf into your uh, jails because since freebsd 13.2 freebsd has yeah. the ability to nullfs mount individual files not uh, just directories with nullfs um, the target has to be of the same file type so you have to create an empty file but it doesn't have to be updated every time mm -hmm. The question is, are we talking about a home lab with dynamic, uh, especially IPv6 addresses, where you have to uh, update the resource cons at all so that it makes sense? Or is this a real deployment on static addresses uh, somewhere on-prem or in semi-static cloud environments? Then, okay, you can just template that out, put it in jail.conf to just on start deploy something, or uh, do it after creation in the created hook so that the jail is there, but you are still outside of it. That can also work, depending on what you want to do. But there's again, no one uh, size fits all solution. It's just that we have lots of mechanisms and you get to pick which one you use. Yeah. There are multiple valid answers and that's both powerful and annoying for new users and for uh, sharing uh, jail snippets because everyone does something different and everyone reinvents the wheel. And Let's I've got to round those wheels. Of them all. Mm -hmm. Let's document those wheels. So that said, uh, Matthias, you had some side notes, and I'd love to know if you have links to go with them. Like Doug and Alice had some uh, some deadlines and news, it looks like. Well, I wouldn't say those were announcement, but uh, they, um, there was a question about uh, uh, in the follow-up call, I mean, the the, the ongoing call on for this uh, for this initiative uh, about uh, what would happen after the October the 11th and uh, uh, basically uh, uh, they said that they wanted to to time box it uh, initially to to so they could know what they were dealing with in terms of uh, uh, demands mostly on on uh, Dog absence uh, time and uh, and bandwidth, mm -hmm. and that based on the uh, uh, situation, uh, Doug is is going on on holiday after the eleventh. But once he gets back, he's very open to to continuing uh, uh, helping people and uh, uh, conducting this uh, this uh, this effort. So I think that's a that's great news, especially for me because I was I'm I'm just starting on this. And uh, would be uh, it would be great. Para and Matthias, do you have a way to get in touch with one another? It sounds like you're both focusing we should, and paying we attention should actually, to uh, especially to because we, I might be going going back and forth the project, so it would be good. Um, 
maybe when we can stop the recording, we can exchange information, Matthias. Sure, with pleasure. Yeah. Go ahead and drop each other your contact information. It's wide open on the doc on the announcement message, but such is life. Then moving on to NetGraph based CNI plugins and such. Uh, you've just been keeping score, it looks like, quite nicely. Right in Rust. Anything else on these other topics? Do, 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 do. Um, the last point is, is one question I had for I I was asking myself, so I thought it might be uh, uh, it might be interesting for other people because my typical uh, low workload or uh, distribution calls for both um, uh, for both uh, a lot of forwarded uh, traffic that uh, is. Uh, uh, made very slow by this uh, LRO uh, situation and outward uh, heavy load of uh, heavy uh, uh, IO load, um, sorry, heavy network load uh, outwards, uh, which benefits from LRO, right? So what is the impact of uh, disabling LRO uh, for this? So based on on DAG's experience, it it uh, it doesn't uh, really affect uh, throughput, but rather it it just adds a few percentages of uh, of uh, load on your uh, on your CPU. So definitely for me, that that means that it's a very acceptable uh, trade off. So that was interesting information for me. Jan, do you have so, any comments on that? Yeah, oh, beat me to it. So LRO and it's uh, inverse TSO. Uh, optimizations for TCP only. Um, LRO basically works by having the network card, its ASIC firmware and driver work together to kind of tell to hopefully transparent lies to the kernel network stack and pretend that the little one and a half kilobyte uh, TCP segments uh, have really arrived as uh, 32 or 64K uh, jumbo grants so that you uh, reduce the packet processing overhead per byte by pretending to have seen fewer packets. And so it's just amortization of the network stack overhead, which helps kilobyte, not bytes. Um, so that basically you pretend that you have maximum sized uh, IP packets or TCP packets uh, under full load. It helps uh, reduce the CPU requirement to saturate a fast network card, but the downside is that the network stack, especially anything uh, firewall and not related, does not see the packets as they appear on the wire, um, which is a real problem because um, it will break down the moment you ever have to retransmit something, have to recreate a state somewhere and match something up against it because then the NUT state does not match what comes in on the network. So the stateful firewall will not match because it sees a, what's there as out of order packets and retransmits or future packets, which it does not yet expect and so on. So that's a real problem. And, Basically, what happens is that you discard the valid traffic as long as it comes in fast enough to trigger this co-scaling uh, optimization. Uh, and only when it feels like you're using an old uh, acoustic poplar and even SSH is laggy and hangs four seconds at a time, only then basically does the timeout in the network card um, mean that you uh, give up um, attempting to merge packets because uh, of the hard latency limit you accept per packet, waiting for another one to merge it with, and then you get the packets correctly and stuff is painfully slow. The moment you think it's working, it stops again because you, your TCP window uh, became reasonable and then uh, 
things are too fast again and you have to wait until uh, the retransmits are slow enough again. So it's really this optimization breaks things and among others, the bridging because to bridge Ethernet frames, you have to see the Ethernet frames as they are on the wire, not the nice the network card came up with to uh, unburden the CPU. And if you bridge on FreeBSD, if you um, use IPFW or PF in any meaningful way, especially for the stateful firewalling and network address translation, you have to disable LRO and TSO on the interfaces it's working on. Uh, so yeah. Uh, so my obligatory it naive works question. Great on a pure host system which does not forward packets and does not deal with retransmits and uh, on in the firewall. So yeah, but if you don't run a stateful firewall and are only a T, uh, IP host, not a bridge, not a router, then it works and really saves you some noticeable CPU cycles on fast networks. So it's not that it is a terrible idea to have that feature. The problem is that we do not transparently enable and disable it in all circumstances, which, yeah, bites people in the ass. Yeah, are you saying it's purely for best, it's optimized for LAN usage, not WAN usage? Is that no, a way to construe it? No, it's optimized for uh, for high packet rates so that you get lots of packets from the same flow within the timeout. So as soon as you have a, so uh, that can be a web server serving lots of fast clients too. Yeah. So basically, it the, the moment it sees a packet belonging to a flow, something in the network card, buffers that uh, and starts a timeout. And uh, if it sees enough packets belonging to the same flow in order to merge them, you get the merged view of them and only have to run the TCP input and so on once. Hmm. Which really, it saves noticeable CPU time on a 10 gig or faster network. On a one gig network with normal-ish CPUs, these days it's not useful or not necessary. It saves a bit of power, but yeah. On a router, in FreeBSD at least, you can't use it because PF, IPFW, and so on, and then on a firewall system, even worse, they have to see the packets as they come in on the wire, not the fantasy world created by this optimization. Um, the cost you pay for disabling it is that you don't get the optimization. Hmm. So um, It's supposed to be, but you have to disable it for correctness sakes because otherwise it just doesn't work. And the horrible thing is that it eventually <coughs> breaks the network in such a way that as long as it's slow enough, it won't, the optimization won't trigger so badly. It repeatedly breaks the network until TCP throttles down <coughs> slow enough that the optimization doesn't trigger. And then it works for a few seconds and then it thinks, oh, it worked, let's grow the connection. Uh, bandwidth, and then it breaks again, it hangs for a few seconds, and then it's very painfully slow again, hmm. works for a few seconds for some definitions of working. It's a really horrible thing to debug <coughs> unless you know what it is and, and go through, okay, what interface did I forget? It's, but if you don't know about it, you can probably use your mind over this. Yeah, okay. So that said, is that a Spec violation, there's my super naive question. That just sounds like, well, let's molest those packets and half the system starts to fail to work as expected. The thing is that it's supposed to be transparent, more or less. So basically, it would be valid on an IP and TCP point of view. Uh, to have an interface type, which is just like ethernet, but with 64 kilobyte frames, mm -hmm. almost 64 kilobyte frames. And that's what this optimization looks like to the network stack, if I understand it correctly. Mm. 
and that wouldn't be invalid. It's just that nobody builds hardware like that. But it would be a lot easier on the CPU to saturate such a network link if it existed. Yeah. Um, so that's much bigger than a Jumbo MTU frame, correct? Yeah. So it's its own uh, kind of super duper frame that's great under some circumstances and mm -hmm. it's a frame. It's a, leaves a trail of destruction otherwise. Of the, the, yeah. Okay. And that's, but it is a real useful optimization to have available. So the problem is that basically, in my opinion, it should default to off if you start forwarding on either IPv4 or IPv6, at least for that family. Uh, yeah. Uh, but okay. that would You're, also be uh... not. Yeah, maybe it's a good idea to add it to NetIF if you have a uh, Basley to come in and disable it if you uh, set gateway or IPv6 gateway on all currently existing interface and add it to the default uh, create for dynamic interfaces to try to disable that. But hey, yeah, it's... Yeah, it's funny. I kind of wish there was don't get me wrong, a new view of the network stack to embrace that, that has nice safeguards between components that don't handle it. Because you, as you described it, people get bitten in the behind routinely. It looks like, like my browser re, reloaded. Sorry about that. Because um, uh, we've touched on this topic countless times over the years, yet never heard it absolutely fully spelled out uh, short of, oh, just turn it off and don't think about it, please, which is not a great strategy in Unix systems. So, yeah. Turning it off is the right thing to do if you have to run a bridge or want to route. <clears throat> and Doug may have a bug to disable it for automatic usage. Uh, Tara, might you... Oh, wait. So disabling it link. on adding a member interface to a bridge would also be a good idea. Uh, it sounds like Doug and Tara have an answer here. Let's see. Uh, let's, let but, me get this link in here. So I, I, I asked the, the same question to to Doug. Yeah. Uh, and he said that this sort of did some things, but it was it fell short of what uh, uh, what would be necessary to really support this. Uh, mm. I've seen his code uh, on on my um on my uh, pkg base uh, 14.1 p5 mm -hmm. uh, in the user src this code is merged is merged so i would imagine that this means that it has landed into the the code base uh, but he said he would be checking okay so the la last uh, comment references a commit, and that just so makes it so that the I assume loaded tunable and CCTL um, to have this driver XN never use LRO or at least not enable it by default on uh, detected interfaces so that basically it does not turn on by default. That's mm. a convenient workaround if you use the network interfaces. Mm. It's not a real fix. It just makes it so that you set one entry in societal conf or loader conf, and it always disables this. It does not mean that it's a proper fix. Did I hear one strategy would be to auto disable when a member of a bridge? That would help for bridged interfaces only. Yeah, but uh, as far as I know, it never makes sense to use LAO and TSO on bridge member interfaces because it will always risk breakage. Yeah, <clears throat> even if all of them use LAO and TSO, the mo because on the wire you can drop individual um, segments, 
the retransmit logic does not work because from the IP the system point of view, then yeah, I have this 32 kilobytes and why are you sending me this package which was never real? Yeah. Yeah. So in this so, whole, if we're talking somehow Zen, but was there any notion of automatic disabling related to bridges? Not that I not? can find okay. of just that it was triggered the, with basically the bug was in the driver, which was supposed to have a setting which is driver specific mm -hmm. to make this driver not enable the, the interfaces LRO support. Um, that society here was a knob, but it shouldn't have been. Mm. So that you ha would have to go in with IF config uh, to for each uh, detected interface disable LRO instead of globally having this driver auto not enable this feature or this anti-feature in this case. So it's that one way to not to disable this optimization which breaks uh, on bridges uh, wasn't working. When it, but it was just a driver specific bug with, where the driver had a feature to disable LRO uh, so that you wouldn't have to go in and see X and zero minus LRO IF config X and one minus LRO in your uh, RC conf or something. Does a bridge so, yeah. have any notion of LRO or it's purely the hardware interfaces attaching to it? The problem I don't know exactly what a bridge driver does. It has grown okay. 10 tackles yeah. over time. Um, so, um, the thing is that there's so many abstractions in there which aren't really documented anywhere. Oh, goodness. Because okay. you're talking about the implementation details of the network stack, which is just implementation defined, not documented and standardized because it's an it's not a stable kernel ABI, API, anything. Yeah. It's just how things are currently done. Okay. So it takes someone familiar with the kernel network stack to uh, tell what this knows and doesn't know, and if there's some indirect communication channel to do that. But there should be some kind of IOCTL or whatever handler. So we add a member, delete a member, which is probably a callback in some struct. So then you can the function pointers, you find that function and you would go in and find out how from inside the kernel basically you do the equivalent of IF config uh, minus LRO and if it's not supported you ignore that because not every interface has that. So you would have to go in and with the correct locking basically make sure that you call the fun function which checks if that NIC is LRO capable and if it's enabled disable it. Okay. And maybe you want to save that state somewhere to, if it's deleted from the bridge as a member, you restore the old LRO state. Um, <clears throat> yeah, mm. maybe. Okay. Uh, Uncle Dave, do you have any wisdom on this topic? Because I will keep observing this keeps coming up. No, Could nothing you... really. I mean, we do the same thing. We disable it everywhere. Yeah. Um, just as a matter of course. Which... But if you have something like an NFS or SMB server, which is not a router, but just a local server, it really helps yeah. reduce your CPU load. Yeah. So it can be useful. Yeah. yeah. And 10G up. 10G up, you want to have it on if you can. One workaround uh, is if you only use um, the firewall to do port forwarding, is to ask yourself, do you do you really need a port for water or can you also use a load balancer like HA proxy or Nginx or traffic to basically not be a router, but just a proxy? Because then you get to keep that. So if you, most of your traffic isn't proxied, but only some of it, you, you can still keep LRO and TSO by using a proxy instead of a firewall to do the redirect if that fits your use case. 
because then the proxy terminates one TCP connection and creates a new connection, which means that from TCP's point of view, you're not a router. From Ethernet's point of view, you're not a bridge, you're just a host, which just happens to have two network connections with some proxy in between. Um, Matthias has a question. Yeah, should we document the option? The oil documentation is often the answer. Um, and it, I will follow him up with a possible candidate, terrible mnemonic. Uh, fan on the LAN, candidate on the WAN. Is that any good for, well, you, it can be very helpful on purely LAN traffic, but routed WAN traffic is consistently um, problematic. It's... No, it's not that the traffic gets routed that's problematic. It's okay. that the system using it acts as a router. Okay. There's well, no problem sending the frames through a router. That works fine. Okay. It's if the system you with the network interface, which has this enabled, is a router or is a bridge or is a firewall. Basically, anything but a host system, which is an endpoint on the network. Okay. Well, maybe we can update my terrible mnemonic here. Um, um, the word can uh, can be misinterpreted easily. Like, you can do it versus trash. Oh, you're right. Oh, that's actually a you know, very good observation. Uh, but... Um um here um, i will politely strike through this but let's try to capture this so, so that one this of doesn't the things keep coming up every we three could months improve is the handbook because uh, if you look chapter 30 uh, 4.8 bridging yeah. uh, it does not mention uh, lotso in that subject uh, Same with congestion it windows. It goes through I, esoteric things like, like private span and sticky, which a lot fewer users will care about. And if we look at the example interface names, FXP, that's like Intel PCI 100 megabit cards. Um, so when that example was written, uh, this optimization didn't exist in common cards. So that there was no need to disable anything. What chapter was that exactly? Uh, 34.8 uh, bridging under advanced networking in the handbook. 34.8? Yep. Uh, more precise, 34.8. Uh, 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 yeah, no, dot eight is the whole sub chapter for bridging. Okay. Well, um, let's call it instead of summer of code, fourth quarter of documentation, because so many topics today have just been documentation. So um, I would not rule out maybe focusing some of these calls on little junior hackathons of like, okay, let's just take on one of these topics and incubate here and push to docs as appropriate. Chris has been very good about championing that, bless his heart. Um, any objections to documenting, documenting, documenting? Because we're on some level, we're going kind of circular on fundamental questions like how to build a jail. Because I, I do wonder that too, and I do have my strategies, but that doesn't mean I've agreed on my own strategies. And we just lost Dave. Take care, Dave. So, uh, Phil, as a resident observer to us, and Matthias as a, a new participant, uh, are we ref reflecting the broader world you see in that regard? Yeah. Okay. Yes, I, I think uh, 
I mean, the, the documentation at this point, I, I think the handbook should be, uh, you know, updated to say, here's how best practices to do a thing rather than trying to find blog posts and, you know, examples and videos and all that, that if it could get updated, say, annually, you know, something like that with the, the current version, because it sounds like there are references going back, you know, a decade or more when it was, uh, it may have been true at that time, but now, you know, with the LRO example, that it's no longer true with current hardware. Yep. Or it, it's it's not that it's no longer true, it's that it's no longer the best practice uh, as you scale up to current hardware. Yep. Right. Seen from, seen from here. Uh, yes, please. Fully, fully aligned with, with you, but uh, I'm, I still have the, the impression that a lot of the, I mean, lately the, the handbook has been uh, moving forward uh, really, I mean, the, 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 the pace has, uh, has, has quickened. Uh, That's good. And a lot of these things are being, uh, are being uh, brought to date and uh, uh, things that are not, no longer relevant uh, are, are being weeded uh, with it out, um, so I wouldn't. I would just wouldn't want uh, uh, that we spread the impression that the the handbook is, uh, you know, hasn't been modified for all that uh, all that time because it's really moving a lot lately. Excellent. And again, I'll thank Chris M for that. He's been just diving in as appropriate without hesitation and that includes manual pages so i'm very grateful for that well it takes people like you and tara to keep us honest insofar as some of us can't always see the forest and the trees as we like to say around here in this forest um so yeah eyes on the prize is another way i like to put it so that said Anything else at this time? It sounds like Matthias and Ara, you might want to get in touch on OCI things. Oh, Dave didn't give a mention. He had to run. No worries. Um, thank you, Jan, as always, for helping mm -hmm. paint that picture because there's some low level things going on and don't use it is really not helpful advice because uh, technology-minded people want explanations and they're not going to learn anything without an explanation. So I thank you for that. So, um, yes. thank you. <laughs> that said, uh, Jan, anytime you feel you have a, a new way to explain these things, uh, please do not hesitate because I think some of this information we've covered earlier was just vocalized in that way for the very first time, despite us talking about the topic for a very long time. So um, if, I mean, thinking way outside the box, would it be wise to simply blanket TSO LRO when there's an existing bridge or jails or something? Is there some way to broadly implement a best practice that will save the most amount of people from burning the most amount of fingers? So I think, but I'm not certain Please. that it should be basically safe because the alternative will never work Define it. to uh, uh, disable LRO and TSO on bridge member interfaces if they support it. So that just while, and if you want to be a bit fancy about it, it would be good to restore the member interfaces a flex which got modified by, uh, by the um, bridge uh, as it was added to restore it when it gets removed. So that then you look back as if you never had that. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so okay. So one, that's one thing care. we could do, which would help everyone who 
creates a bridge, adds physical interfaces, probably just one to it, and then uh, adds uh, e pairs for bridges or tabs for Beehive, because that would then just work out of the box without manually changing anything. Okay, for the did I hear you say we should track the state prior to entering a bridge such that it's like, let's That's preserve it. So that it the bridge for... driver would restore it when you visit the LRO TSO setting, just so that adding a member interface to a bridge and then removing it leaves the interface unmodified. That said, what mechanism could tra trace it? And don't get me wrong, we've talked about has to be system a, preservation. There's a callback on the bridge driver, which the kernel invokes, every basically a function which it calls every time an interface is added as a member and when one is deleted as a member. Uh, and that function will have to do it. And if the state is to be saved away and then restored, it has to allocate, unless it can stuff it in some already allocated structure, um, the modifications it did. I think there has to be something in there already because uh, the bridge driver already disables IPv6 link local addresses on member interfaces so that you cannot fuck up completely by having one link scope per member interface and one for the bridge when you should only have one for the bridge because otherwise you com would completely violate the IPv6 specification of what an interface scope is, because from the IP point of view, the bridge is the link and the member interfaces are just ports on a bridge and not links in an IP on uh, v 6 scoping view. So we already have that built in. So there's probably some code you could easily piggyback on did you say there can't be link local addresses on both the host and the members, or how would you yes. phrase that? You can't have, no, not the host, uh, the bridge and the uh, member interfaces. Okay. Because the, the, the inter, there can be only one interface scope, and that has to belong to the bridge interface. So that you must not have, really must not have uh link local addresses on bridge member interfaces configured. On the bridge, of course, there you need it. Yeah. But only the bridge can have it because otherwise the network stack, when you receive an IP packet, considers it scope to the member interface and that's not the correct interpretation. That's will break because, yeah. So. Um, type, uh, and it, must it could break badly the... ICMP v6 so badly that the interface becomes unusable for IPv6 because neighbor discovery and stuff just doesn't work. Uh, and I basically that's the equivalent of breaking up in IPv4. So you just don't learn the right um, MAC addresses for the members for your neighbor cache. So yeah, it will completely break IPv6 um, on that I... interface if you do that. And it's implemented by default so that it does the right thing and it even tells you something if you have things like the legacy enable IPv6 by default so that as the member interfaces are brought up, the IPv6 enabled if you set IPv6 activate all interfaces to yes, then the bridge will undo that and the RC script will warn you that it had to do that. Okay. Is that keeping track of state in doing that? Mm -hmm. Because state tracking has um, been a, con a concern so throughout every Matthias, single call. Regarding your question, yeah. um, there is more than just one flag, but it's basically an interface uh, option. Uh, and it's just ifconfig interface name minus LRO um, or dash LRO. Um, the same for TSO, but there can be variants because some network cards only supported for IPv4. So there are maybe separate flags. If you have an all 
old server NIC. Uh, it could be that it has LRO4 instead, instead of LRO for both protocols. Uh, and then there's an equivalent uh, LRO6 flag, which could also, then it, there's a special case where some cards can do it um, only for untapped frames. So they, I think there's a VLAN variant. So go for the man page and just check. Uh, or if you want to care about a specific system, look at the IF config output and just run it through grab dash uh, uh, and then filter for LRO and TSO. And it's always a substring in any of the names. And the IF config man page tells you all the things, but it's a very long man page. I'll find it. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so, and LRO alone is not, it's the TSO, sorry, not LRO. So, you, LRO is not split, but you have TSO, TSO6, and TSO4. So, yeah. And Where did that question take place? Uh, a direct message. Oh, thank you. Okay, cool. It, but I think it's relevant to everyone very... uh, in this call. Um, so, I just answered. It's not um, like there's anything, any private information. In no, no, totally. And I mean, I don't think I've heard this more clearly described. So the more you can paint this picture for people who look at it from a different perspective, mm -hmm. the better. So hate to say it, so, keep yeah. it coming. Um, so then the, there is also a VLAN a hardware TSO. Ah. Uh, uh, you just and, uh, and some the... cards supposedly have the XLAN hardware TSO, so that they actually hardware accelerate the XLAN encapsulation. I think only the Connect X5 and X6 or something like that implemented, so that basically the XLAN encapsulation is free uh, for the network stack because the network card and its firmware will demultiplex that, put it in a dedicated ring buffer and pre-encapsulated. Yeah, can, so can that you it review looks... My list here? Hmm? Can you review my list of types of TSO yeah, so here? T and the LRO1. Uh, yeah, just look for the substrings LRO and TSO in the main page. Okay. You won't get false positives if you do that. Okay. Basically, anything the card has, which it's listed in there, disable it if it's a bridge member, or if you want to run a stateful firewall, which, yeah, or a potentially stateful firewall even. Okay. Mm hmm So, yeah. Gee, this makes perfect sense after like four years of discussing it. Okay. Yeah, and as Rod pointed out, out about congestion control, they don't teach this. Not mm -hmm. helpful. Do you think a, C, a Cisco, what is it, CCNA or whoever describes the implications of TSO and LRO configuration on bridges? Not so sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else at this time, or shall we call it good at uh, yes. 1825 UTC? Yes, there's one more thing. Yes, please. So if I can take the screen for a second. Yes, sir. Oop, let me pick. Are you going full Steve Jobs on us? One more thing. Okay, I like it. Oh, no, uh, just basically that I have just one thing. Okay. Oh, Sure, so can you like, see my screen uh, or my yes, window? Sir. Yes, uh, the wider the yep. better for ideally 1080p. Go ahead, that should be about a reasonable size. Ooh, right? You had some great stuff on LRO TSO on a manual page. Yeah, that's just from the IF config man page. Okay, I'll put but Tara there. had to leave. Yes. Um, Uh, yeah, I think Phil now might be answering your question about package-based yeah. jails. So that is without any 
cache trickery. It's just fetching firmware errors and then decompressing the Z ZSTD compressed packages on a low power system, which is what it's taking up time. If you pre-decompress the packages and so on, you can save a lot of time doing that and get it down to like less than 15 seconds for a reasonable configuration. This is about as far as you can trim the base system without losing things people will notice. Uh, and it's already uh, at runtime, so yeah. The main pages are already removed from that, and I just, so if I do this, da -da -da um, Did you say Z standard, Z standard? Yeah, the packages of the base system yeah. are compressed. Yeah. <laughs> so let's have a look. So um, as we can see, the record size is one megabyte. Ooh. Z4 compression is enabled. And the full system, hmm? um, why is it not? Um, so yeah, the small system, it takes 132, 131 megabytes uh, on disk. And that would be 243. Uh, something decompressed without a Z4 compression. And you can further trim it down to 104 by getting rid of the main pages. Um, but how I did that is I have a gel. So this is with the uh, little patch installed to make uh, the gel command execute executable config files and read the standard output so that I can automate things and have to type out uh, less boilerplate. So inside my, uh, oops, inside my uh, gel directory, I have a little script called dears.conf. It's, if I execute that, uh, like it would be, um, so it would be invoked with basically that. Up. So this is how it would be invoked by the jails command. And this is what it outputs, the equivalent configuration. And inside, let's start with the tiniest one. Um, I have a bunch of files which get all get included by the um, glob pattern in the output of the first script. Then the devfs conf is just yeah basically boring. The interesting part ones are the ones named like the jail hooks. Um, like prepare, start, stop. That one references a shell script, which uh, applies some quoting uh, to shell scripts in the exec directory and uses RC order to sort them and so on and select them. So that you only have to symlink something into the uh, exec directory and it will, just like the RC scripts, will resolve the right order to run them in. And so, for example, I can have something like um, the ZFS here, um, just a bit of formatting help. And then in the end, what it does is it just checks that we have a ZFS compressed uh, data set. Uh, and if not, it creates it of a jail so that the jail gets its own file system. And for the um, 
package base. That's probably the thing you're most interested in. This is how I currently do it. It can probably be done a bit better. The same little formatting help. And then first of all, I check if there's already a snapshot named after the specific OS release. So basically something like 14.1 release P5 or something right now. Uh, if it is, it assumes that that base system exists. So uh, then it checks a special ZFS property because it's not safe to use the package manager without a full jail isolation on an untrusted jail. So in the root ZFS dataset, I have a user property, jail colon fresh, which tracks if this is still a fresh file system, which can be trusted, or that it's potentially compromised by running the code in it and installing arbitrary packages in it because uh, packages can have um, scripts inside of it, have them, and if those scripts uh, are executed with just the dash dash root the option uh, to package, then um, they're executed without isolation from the host environment as root in the host environment. So you could do arbitrary things to the host environment by having a malicious package with, a, let's say, a conflict to the dependency of the next thing, then it would auto resolve that and then um, run or just upgrade a package by having your own repository with just a malicious little package with an innocent look sounding name, like some random library you kind of expect to be there so that it, you would not worry about it. Um, okay, what you can do then is um, here, I set a, the argument list to a bunch of directories which have to exist, run install to uh, create the directories as needed. Then a little more complex than necessary, I uh, write out um, basically a repository configuration for the package manager inside the path of the jail. The necessary directories have been created by the previous step. Um, the next thing is, which is a bit annoying, that I have to uh, also copy the public keys uh, of the release engineering team so that the jail kind of soft change rooted uh, package manager can still uh, validate the packages against that public key which definitely should be done if you fetch them. So that's this uh, three line files. Yes, there's an empty line at the beginning of a file for some reason. Um, it's just the format. Then the first step I do is that I silence a bunch of warnings because the jail potentially runs a different uh, FreeBSD, even major version, than the base uh, uh, system. So for example, if you're running 15 current in your home lab machine, you may still want to deploy a 14 run jail to it, which is what I did here. Um, so uh, I disable the warnings if the OS version doesn't match the host one, both the small one and for major. And I have to override the ABI because there's nothing to auto detect from in an empty jail directory. And then once I have fetched, or by, sorry, updated the uh, local copy of the package repository database, I can now um, run a remote package query to um, against that database so that I can I use a package um, R query evaluation expression to select which packages to install into the jail. So that I don't have to list them all, but can use globs to select and deselect sets of packages. And my specification and the next step is to fetch the packages 
you know, just because if I directly install it, you have to wait so long with nothing happening. So now that the packages are fetched, I then install them, which is basically the same command as we want above, just without the fetch only step so that it now uses the cache. Um, now I install the uh, package manager into the jail so that the package manager is already bootstrapped. And that really helps a bit because it's otherwise you would immediately have to package bootstrap uh, inside it to do anything with packages, even update the whole the base system. So yeah, it doesn't make sense to have a package based system without package installed. At least not if it's supposed to do anything with itself. Then I clean the package cache because I don't want each jail to keep a cache of installed packages inside of it, which would basically be the, a copy of what I already have. And then I also, because I kind of expect this to be used as a starting point for thin jails, so I don't want to have a stale, stale old snapshotted uh, package repository database in there because I sure hope that it frequently changes because otherwise the build cluster is broken. <laughs> so uh, I also remove the package cache, which makes the jail a lot smaller because the in with all the indexes, that's like 40 megabytes in var db uh, pkg, just to index all the 30 or 40,000 packages we have. Um, now that all of this has been done, I use a ZFS channel program to atomically, uh, in one ZFS transaction, both set the user property to false and take a snapshot. This means that you can never observe an intermediate step where uh, only one of the two has uh, been done. Because well, it happens. PS, is this making sense and does that paint the picture on one strategy? This is something I had to learn more about. It looks uh, with the complexity, I'll look at the recording to uh, mm -hmm. see how it all fits together. There's yeah. a lot going on. Jan sees things so that the rest of us don't see. But the result is that I can now do, uh, sorry, Jim. so I stop it. I start it, and because one of the first things the expensive step does is it checks if it already has the snapshot. So it will just the next time not package install itself because it finds the snapshots to take an early out. so that you can leave that in, in your normal jails configuration. You don't have to modify it into a bootstrap configuration. You just make it so that it uh, short circuits early so that you can just leave it in by default. Because just checking if the snapshot directory in the .zfs directory exists is so cheap that I don't consider it worth dealing with modifying the jail configuration uh, to only include the bootstrap logic the first time. And this is how I found I can get a easy to use uh, thick jail with its own copy. So this is a tiny jail but it's still a thick jail, so JXX. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, CP, let's copy the resolve config because I haven't automated that. Um, just a lab system. Okay, Jan, how close are we to the punchline on this? So now the system package info sees all of its packages and run package update. And it's a working FreeBSD system inside the jail. Beautiful.
Nice. You can self manage from the point on. And, and so to your point just about package Aladdin upgrade Roman, will now uh, also upgrade your uh, jail user land. Oh, the part I skipped over is here's the query, for example. This is how you get to subset the base system uh, using my script. Basically, it's, it starts out by matching against anything starting with FreeBSD dash something. Meaning a base package. A base package. It also specifies your repository at that stage, but hey, still, basically, it, this is the starting point. And then I deselect anything which ends in lib32, then anything which is debug related, anything which is the development related. Then this is what makes it the tiny instead of the small. I also remove the main pages, which is like 20 megabytes or something. Is that really worth doing? But hey, as an experiment, why not? I, I definitely don't want to have uh, the big kernel and all the driver kernel modules uh, inside a jail unless I have to. Uh, the bootloader are the same. I have to evict uh, the BSNMP one because it has, for some reason, a dependency on one of the tests, and the tests are 70 megabytes. Then one of the biggest is to wear out the compiler. Uh, and the linker and the debugger, those are just giant tools, especially with the debug um, symbols. I think the debug symbols for LLVM and Clang alone are like 500 megabytes which is crazy, but it is what it is. Could you drop also that kick... text into chat, please? Because you've nailed the, the heavy lifting that I've been struggling with for 20 years on making small jails. Not that there was Clang 20 years ago, but there were kernels. Thank you, thank you. Um. So yeah, I uh, then uh, also kick out the rescue uh, because it's another 20 megabytes or so which I don't need in a jail because none of the tools exist only as rescue tools. And if you break the jail user land, you can always use the host to recover. Or you can install the rescue package if you want using FreeBSD package dash jail um, to have the package manager run inside the jail to recover. And then, um, FreeBSD 14.1, also unlike 14.0, uh, has packages for the user land and kernel land source code. So basically slash use user SSC everything, and then user SSC uh, sys, which is several hundred megabytes as well. Um, okay, there the size is more or less reasonable. And then the last one is, as I said, the tests, which I also kicked out because uh, I don't need them in a minimal jail. I certainly had to let go of D-Trace, not because it's that big, but just because I don't get to enjoy D-Trace in a jail safely in, on FreeBSD because um, D-Trace is too powerful for the jail subsystem to safely contain, so it has to be unavailable. Anyway, so don't expose the D-Trace devices to... <coughs> Jan, uh, yes. you'd be doing Rod's work to very simply make a list of the size of each of these major components, because that's, uh, that's ultimately uh, just, what the build option survey That's one package query uh, array. Okay, You well, can do it like this. You, scripty, uh, scripty. Uh, package qu uh, query, let's, uh, let me check <clears throat> a man package uh, query flat. Yeah, dash s, a uh, percent s, hmm. and then um, you can either get it in bytes or humanize. The problem is that the humanization uses proper se naming, which sort doesn't understand. So we go with bytes, and then later humanize the numbers if you want to. Hmm. So you can let's do that. Let's go into the full one, and then um, package query. Do, 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 do. Oh, 
So we can first limit ourselves to um, to three BSD dash star, and then we want the SB and the um, name that so that should give us that. Now we run that for sort. And we get the worst offenders at the bottom of the list. In bytes. So that's like 800 megabytes for this user length source code, then 638 megs for the let Would me you check drop that in we chat? can't just we'll possibly uh, humanize it. Right? Yeah, try the human. H N. Uh, yeah, uh, and only the problem is yeah. That, ooh, could you drop that in chat, please? I'll, yep, I'll sure. Let's uh, let's. Let's take the biggest. Yes, beautiful. You're doing Rod's work. T-shirt number seventeen, or I don't know some number. Yes, please. Thank you, sir. Fantastic. Um, yeah. But what what's missing, in my opinion, which would really make package base a lot more user friendly, is some first of all meta packages for the lib32 debug dev and so on sets and basically for all subsets of those a few flags so that you could install something like freebsd-dbg to have all the debugging pulled in through a meta package. Yeah. Uh, the, those are kind of intentionally right now not generated. This has been brought <laughs> up before. So the problem is that at the time there was the opinion that, oh yeah, but when we get uh, proper sub package supports a that you can have one port uh, produce multiple packages with one build of a port, and that, like flavors, which requires you to run the port completely build it for each uh, flavor. Um, so that would be relevant to things like Nginx, where you could then have the port with lots of uh, Nginx modules enabled by default, build, and the result being an Nginx minimal without modules package and then one package per module, which you could then install as wanted, which great idea, but not completely implemented. So not a real world option. And just having a, a handful um, of meta packages would really help organize things. Um, it could be argued that it would be a good idea to have pretty much, much the sets I've described here um, uh, as with my, with my query also as a meta package so that you could have a meta package called FreeBSD, a tiny, small, and full, which would then have a dependency on everything relevant to it to pull it in so that you would have a reasonable number of subsets of the base systems uh, who you could argue with port maintainers about if you can expect this package to work in that configuration or if you, as the port maintainers, only have to look at your uh, bug report if you tested it with a full user land or something. Correct, but it should be easy to make your own meta packages on the fly if it's not already. Yes, it is. Are you done you with could, the share? Can I jump in? Yes, you can have a screen awesome. back. Thank you, sir. No, that was fantastic. And actually, I want to share because uh, there's some, I'm documenting all this. So let me grab this here. And it's got some really loud, obnoxious stuff. Just one moment. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, so Jan, yes. we've had your one more thing, which is a fantastic so, demo, um, which is captured. But here's your query. I just want to catch up everyone. Mm -hmm. And here is the magical heavy lifting that query so, is invaluable and motivating. So I've kind of highlighted I can, the ones. I can try the same query on a recent 
fifty current. Okay, and is utility is kind of the dumping ground for everything else, like miscellaneous? Yeah, it's Does barely it sound anything like? you user space commands, things like I have config and so on. Yeah. Barely okay. anything which hasn't gotten its own and contains some kind of command belongs in there. Things like I don't know, Yeah. probably tar CP. Which So is. it's not like you can uh, remove it. Yeah. So You can only that's good further to know. subdivide it. And here the, the next thing is that it's So. quite basically a full FreeBSD user land is just shy of 600 packets. Uh, Uh, 520, 530 or so, depending on which FreeBSD version. Uh, and that's 15. I've, that's just package query. Um, Uh, let's do an R query package, R query dash R base. Mm -hmm. While you do that, I've noted that that number of packages, I've noted that So, yeah, it's trace like can't be safely used in a jail. FreeBSD 15 current um, in D64 has. 538 packages right now, slowly going up as things are further subdivided Okay. into individual packages. But the issue is that that just drowns out your uh, Yeah. output in package edge info because suddenly it's not 20 lines, it's almost 600 lines. Uh, and basically now you always have to grab and or directly in package uh, filter. Yeah. And yeah, the quality of life improvement I would like to see is that it kind of these a new flag for this meta packages if you ex have an exact match with that set, basically uh, it would just say you have free BSD base or you have free BSD uh, Like Yeah, pool training. FreeBSD user land, FreeBSD minimum. So that on, yeah, but really that you get a set of like a short one line description of which subset you have Yep. if it fits one of the neatly describable ones. Amen. Um, So I've put your want list in there, which you or just touched some kind on. of aggregation that tells you just you have 400 out of 530 uh, base packages installed Yeah. by default so that it does not drown out the output. It's not that it's hard to work with, it's just that it's annoying every time you use it. Yeah. Uh, basically, you run package info, uh, the 500 lines fly by, and then, okay, package info pipe grab. Yeah. Yeah. Let's be honest, that's what real world users will do. Uh, instead of opening them main pages for package query to only print the both um, matching the package query con evaluation condition. Um, I assume quite a number of the flame wars are basically driven by this annoyance over Hmm. the years. <laughs> okay. Whenever Baptiste or someone showed the list and basically the uh, the whole room would moan that, oh no, 500 more packages and I have the user and yeah, it's just I will the, observe that doesn't the sound human like a small problem, system. not a te real technical problem, but yeah. I'll even throw that in there. Uh, oop, not there. Okay, well, while I do that, would you like the honors? Like and subscribe. Perfect. Everyone, thank you so much. We've actually covered some really good ground, especially elaborating on TSO LRO and what that truly, truly, truly means under the hood. That's been years in the making. So I thank you all. I wish you a great week and I'll catch you perhaps tomorrow. Awesome. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. All right. Bye.